To have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200 inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. Sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's up, you guys? Uh, new episode of Eastman's Elevated here. So this week on the podcast, I have on Jimmy Herman. So um, Jimmy, you may know him. He's a professional musician, um, but he also just loves to bow hunt. Uh, the guy bow hunts, um, he lives there in Nashville. He's got a little piece of property that he hunts there, surrounding states. He grew up bow hunting, and then he's been traveling out west and doing these adventure hunts. So um, he's traveled before and hunted elk and harvested a nice bull. Um, this year he's got a mule deer tag, thinking about hunting elk again, and and I've just I've really enjoyed getting to know him. We've had a couple phone conversations and then this podcast, and we just get along really well, and and uh, we both have the same passion: bow hunting critters and and organic meat. So um, it it went really well. Really excited to share this with you guys. Um, so today's sponsor is Swagger Bipods. Um, so I'm really excited about these bipods. Um, Swagger sent me one to try out. Uh, gosh dang it, I I got it mounted to my gun. Um, I'm just so impressed. Like the legs go at different angles. You can shoot from a prone, from a sitting, from a kneeling position. Uh, the legs adjust to different heights. Um, they also they swivel out and get wider and just use tension. So therefore, you know you can lower your point of aim or raise your point of aim really quickly with these things. Also, they make shooting uphill and downhill really easy, as you can put the legs away from you and it kind of pulls the rifle into you. So I, I've been super impressed. They're, they're built lightweight, really good design on these things, and, and they're really going to work well for Western game. Uh, I can't wait to start getting my daughter used to these things my wife used to these things um, so we can always have them on the gun I've been using using shooting sticks over the last few years and and they give you a rest aim but it's just nothing like having it connected to your gun uh, it, it also swivels to different angles so you can always hold your rifle level but like I say I can't say enough good things it's a great company swagger bipods check them out you guys um, over there at Eastman's we've got a Father's Day special coming up um, so you can go on and you can get a free call, a free, uh, not a free subscription. You have to pay for the subscription, but it is a, a reduced price on the subscription. I believe it's twenty nine ninety nine for both magazines, the bow hunting journal and the Eastman's hunting journal. Um, I just got some awesome articles I've been working on. They just keep giving me good projects as well as the, the staff is always working hard to get you guys the best information. So super magazine, get a call, both magazines, twenty nine ninety nine father's day special. Uh, go check that out guys and, and subscribe to a great magazine. Um, and with that, let's get this thing rolling. So, uh, Jimmy Herman Eastman's elevated. Here we go. All right. I'm here with Jimmy Herman. Jimmy, thanks a bunch for being on with me. Hey, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, you're just a diehard bow hunter. I've been following your social media, and so mm -hmm. um, it looks like you keep really busy playing for Carrie Underwood, playing the fiddle, and then yeah, sure. um, you try to bow hunt in all your free time, and you're you're really um, you really work on on keeping yourself in good shape year round and putting all your effort. I know you work on your own bows. I just think that's really cool. Um, bet you're looking forward to this season, huh? Uh, yeah, I really am, man. Um, I've been uh, actually working on a property for whitetails uh, most of this year already, so I'm pretty pumped. Oh, right on. Now, is that your place in Nashville, or do you have another place you're going to hunt? Oh, yeah. So this is uh, – I'm talking about my home in Nashville. We're out on 50 acres here, just north of, north of Nashville, and we've been here about a year. But I was on tour all last year, so I really only got the hand – or sorry, excuse me, I uh, got to hunt about a handful of, uh, you know, sits. And I actually, I actually got a buck last year, but um, – uh, since I've been home this January, I've been able to get out on the property and really, uh, do some, uh, you know, land management things and, uh, hopefully, hopefully all for the better for this year. Oh, it'll pay off for sure. Um, how cool. So tight schedule last year, you were able to make it home and harvest a buck during the season, huh? Yeah, I, I played a show in Indiana. Uh, maybe I guess it was the night before played the show, got back on the bus. 
um, got home. I didn't even go to bed. So I put on my camo and went out and rattled in this buck. And uh, that was it. Yeah, I, pro- I probably hunted, I don't know, maybe five, six, you know, five, five or six sits before I got this buck. So, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Oh, man, good for you. Congratulations. And um, Thanks. On no sleep. How intense is that? <laughs> hey, 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 you know, it's priorities. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, so I'm from Wisconsin, and I, I hunt uh, – up there too for white white tails and I mean it's a, it's a thirteen hour drive and I can hammer through that nonstop and not go to bed get there put camel on and go hunt too so uh, yeah oh, under, under different circumstances maybe maybe I need some sleep but not when I bow hunt <laughs> <laughs> well it's just uh, doing whatever it takes we're all so busy in today's day and age no matter what we're doing you know and so you kind of got to squeeze in your time so you can you know, get your sanity and get your time in the woods. But I bet it's so relaxing when you get in the woods and you're in the tree stand and it's quiet just because, you know, everything's so chaotic, um, you know, with your work, uh, traveling around and playing shows and things. Right. Well, I mean, man, it's it's awesome to play for thousands of fans, right? Um, and then, but my, my balance is when I get out, you know, get out the stand and it's dead quiet, that's just me out there. And uh, man, I, I live for that too, you know? Well, and I do my best um, thinking and evaluation just in my own life and and not even all about hunting, but I can just reflect on things in my life with my family and my work and my direction. And it seems like you need that quiet in your life to be able to reflect on that, where if you're just going all the time, you just don't get a break to think about those things. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like a a chance to recharge your battery, you know. Uh, For me... um, I spend a lot of time. I, I do a lot of my prayer, uh, my, my prayers, out in, in the woods. You know, when I'm just, it's just me. It's like I'm alone. God's got me right there. You know, I'm not focused on, you know, other things, music or social media or anything else going on at home. Uh, and it's just, it's just me and, uh, you know, me and, me and the quiet. So uh, I get a lot of, I get a lot of that prayer stuff done. <laughs> Man, good for you. That's the best time to do it. So um, yeah. you're putting in a lot of work on the farm this year, and and you do like a you do one year where you're super busy touring, and then the next year you've got some more free time. So this is like your free time year, is that right? Yeah. So uh, you know, in, in in past years, I guess we we tour pretty much a solid year, and then we take a year off. And I say a year off, we're just not on tour, so we'll still play shows here and there. Um, just, we're just not out as, as much as we were, you know, if we were, we're on actually on tour. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, so, well, this ought to be your season, then you'll have some more time during this hunting season. You won't have to do the, uh, all night approach on it, huh? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, if, if I, even if I get a day to hunt, I'll do it, you know, but, um, you know, th- this year I'm really looking forward to getting out West and doing some elk hunting and, uh, uh, I've got a mule deer hunt planned. Um, and it's, you know, get back up to Wisconsin for whitetails and then obviously hunt whitetails around Nashville too. So, um, hopefully, hopefully this, this year opens up to where I can do more hunting this fall. Man, good for you. You got a mule deer hunt planned, huh? Yeah, I do. I do. I got a buddy out in Montana, uh, and we're going to try and uh, connect on a, on a buck out there. Right on. Yeah. That's my neck of the woods. Um, good for you. So you're going to come out. Um, do you know your dates you're going to come out? Uh, it's going to be sometime in November, you know, time to rut. Time, yeah. Hopefully during the rut. So, uh, I don't have specific dates set yet cause it, my, it, my schedule is still kind of up in there, but, uh, I do have that. I, I do have November open. <laughs> oh man. Good for you. So you'll team yeah. up with your buddy and you guys are going to go chase mule deer around. Are you going to, so I know you're a diehard bow hunter. Are you going to bow hunt in November when you're out here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, all bow hunting. Oh, right on. Good for you. That's the way I run, too, is all bow hunting. Well, the reason I ask is because November is our gun season, and so um, you have to wear hunter orange when you're hunting with a bow during rifle season, but that's what I run every year is I I hunt with my bow. It just means so much more to me. I just love – you know, the, the challenge of it and getting close and the, I, I love how intimate it is, you know, with the animals when, when you're in tight like that. So man, good for you. You're going to have a blast right. out here. We got really good populations. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And you know, the thing about bow hunting during uh rifle season and I'm a rifle hunter too, but, uh, I mean, more times than not, I've really killed a lot of animals actually within bow range during rifle season, <laughs> like rifle hunting. So uh, you know, going out and blaze orange with a bow, it, it you know, 
uh, with with those with the you know the odds. Um, I think they're in my favor. <laughs> I like to think that. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, I, the Hunter Orange just doesn't bother me much. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm in bear season now, and uh, it feels a little weird when you first put it on and you have a bow in your hands. But really, those animals they pick up on movement far more than they pick up on, you know, what camo pattern you have on. It just seems like if you if you make the right movements and you use the the character, the feature, of the land to get close, you know, you can get just as close with orange on. Yeah, that's right. And you know, like you know, guys like Fred Bear, uh, I don't know that they ever wore any uh, camo, really. <laughs> you know, you always see them in like plaid and jeans or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I mean, as long as you keep your movements to a minimum, um, you should be all right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the flannel used to be the old camo, didn't it? That's it, right? Yeah, all the old timers are all the the pictures of my old family hunting. Everybody, you know, had plaid on or. Uh, had flannel on when they were hunting and that's what i grew up as a kid that's what i always wore Mm -hmm. yeah well now we got a lot of options you know there's a lot of great camo patterns out there and i definitely think good earth tones make a difference but it, it really is like keeping to the shade and then you know animals really pick up on your movement so so anytime they can see you're you're exposed keeping your movement low but man good for you yeah you're gonna have fun out here and you say you got an elk hunt plan too yeah, I'm planning on going to Idaho, uh, mainly because, you know, Idaho is over the counter for archery. So if I do have a free, you know, week and I can pop out there, I'll, I can just, you know, hit up Walmart or something and get a tag. Yeah, good for you. I, I love those easy to get over the counter tags. And I pulled the trigger this year on Idaho too. Idaho, like I've hunted about every Western state out there and been successful on it. Idaho is like my last stronghold and it's three hours away from Montana. And I just, oh, yeah. I haven't been able to narrow down my spot there yet, but I, I finally pulled the trigger this year and bought an over the counter mule deer tag down there. So I'm going to try to hunt them. They, they offer multiple seasons, but I'll think I'll, I'll go down. I got this high country spot that I'm really psyched to go check out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I, I mean, it's crazy. Idaho has, it has everything, you know, um, pretty much any animal you can get in the States is in Idaho. You know, there's white, there's great whitetail hunting and there's great mule deers or, um, great elk, you know, um, the antelope, there's plenty of antelope, you know, there's sheep, there's mountain goats, there's moose, you know, Man, I know it. Idaho does have it good. I don't know why it's taken me this long to hunt it, but super psyched to get in there this year. And and you've been successful in Idaho before, right? Yeah, I have. I killed a, I killed a nice bull out there. Man, good for you. That elk hunting during the rut, uh, there, um, there isn't much. I mean, all bow hunting's fun and all critters are fun, but there's something about those elk during the rut that's just so thrilling and exciting. So good for you. That had to be a killer encounter, huh? Oh, yeah, it was awesome, man. It was, uh, you know, there, it's, there's nothing like having a screaming bull come, you know, within bow range, you know, you know, especially like in the mornings coming over the, you know, coming through the mountains, through the through the timber, and it's just an unreal experience. You know, if uh, I never, I didn't grow up elk hunting, like I grew up in Wisconsin, so we had, we were, had whitetails, you know, but um, if I had to pick, I would give up whitetails any day for elk <laughs> yeah um hands down yeah for sure when it's when it's like i love hunting mule deer and whitetails and i love hunting bears i love hunting all species but when it's the middle of september and it's elk season there's nothing on planet earth i'd rather be doing i love oh, chasing yeah. bugling bulls i love them yeah that's awesome yeah mm-hmm. well and um they're they're big targets which is good but uh they just get your adrenaline pumping so hard like i remember you know i can remember shooting arrows clear over their back being a good bow shot just because they get me so worked up and so excited when they come in screaming like that and it took a while before i could keep my composure together to actually you know make a good lethal shot and and uh, execute on one of those things all right well the thing is like you know and when you're target practicing you're like man these things are huge you know how can you miss one but in the in the heat of the moment uh you know they uh, they get pretty pretty narrow. <laughs> Man, well, and it um yeah, it just takes a while. Like when you start bow hunting, you get the you get in that fog of adrenaline, and, and it seems like you want a shot so bad. Whatever that animal is, you've been working right. so hard towards getting a shot, and when it finally happens, like you just want to get the shot. 
Yeah, and you want the shot to go whether you hit him or not. Like you just you just want to get the shot, and like you don't you don't sit and execute like you do in a target, and you let that fog of adrenaline get into you, and then you know then you miss, and then you you just can't have it back, you know. And so th- your right. only choice is redemption, and to say okay next time I'm gonna keep calm, I'm gonna execute my shot, and, and I like to. I, I like to ha- like have a mantra when I'm when I'm shooting at animals to try to keep myself calm. But it it takes a while to get that calm. I'm sure you got a lot of practice with whitetail over the years, but um, that's tough to do. Yeah, it does. It's it, it is tough to do. And the thing is, like, I mean, you, you really got to practice and get yourself, um, you know, get reps in, you know, real life situations. You know, um, and the other thing is is. Um, it's 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 nice if you have encounters with like say you know elk, you know smaller bulls or cows before that big bull comes through. You know what I mean. So you kind of like warmed up to the situ you know being out hunting and the situation before that big bull comes in. Because I mean the the first first elk you see is this giant bull. Yeah, your adrenaline's gonna go off the charts. You know, I might be wrong, but that's how I feel. Dude, I think you're right. Like, I think you got to ease into the excitement a little bit. And if you can see some cows or some smaller bulls, or like, I like to even when I, you know, if I see a a smaller bull and I'm in range, like, I like to hold up my bow and think what it's going to be like or how it's going to be like. But you're right. Like, getting accustomed to it, I I think, is a big part of it. And another thing you said, like, getting in your reps. So the muscle memory and practicing with your bow and, and being comfortable and being a good shot is super important. But it, like you were saying, it's almost the reps on animals. It's drawing back on an animal and executing a good shot. And the the more you can practice that, the better and more comfortable you get. Right. I mean, a good way to practice, I think, is, you know, if you if you can, you know, run, do some do some sort of cardio, get your heart rate up and then sh- and then shoot. You know, that's probably the best simulate simulation you have to an actual um, hunting encounter. Yeah. No, you're so right. Like um, run down to the target and run back and your heart rate's up. And so therefore you kind of aim like you're going to aim on that giant six point bull when he's standing out in front of you. You know, your heart rate's up and the pin's not going to stay stable. It's going to swim around a bit and you got to keep pulling and keep pulling. Yeah, I like that. And then like also just like push ups or pull ups to get your arms really fatigued, you know, too, Mm -hmm. to where then you just don't aim as good. Um, I like that one. And then also like off balance like trying to stand on one foot and execute because you know you're standing on on level grass usually in my flip-flops when i'm practicing but when you're in real life and in the mountains you're on some steep angle or you're on you know one foot planted and so yeah if you can practice all those scenarios it's just gonna make you that much better yeah that's it i mean if you're always just getting out of your truck, you know, nonchalant and like, oh yeah i'm gonna go fling some arrows and you're, you're at flat ground you know, the, like the the chances of you being 100% calm in a hunting situation is pretty much zero, in my opinion. You know what I mean? <laughs> I do. I know exactly so, what you mean. Well, yeah. and two, like um, putting pressure on yourself. And so when you're out practicing, like if you can just self-impose pressure on yourself, that helps. But also like just yeah. shooting with your buddies. It's amazing uh, how much your groups grow, like just shooting with a good friend. And you wouldn't think that'd put pressure on you, but when you get mm-hmm. your buddies, you want to perform and shoot good groups. And it's like that added pressure. And, and then to take it even a step further with some of the 3d shoots or, uh, you, you know, tournament shooting or, uh, shooting with a group of friends or on a line, but any of that pressure just helps you prepare for that high pressure situation when you do have that bull or buck standing in front of you. Right, and and another way I like to practice is I like uh, practicing with you know rather extreme angles. You know what I mean, like quartering to quartering away kind of things with with targets. You know what I'm saying, like sh- shots you normally wouldn't take in the field, but if you practice those extreme angle shots, and you know with trees and branches and all that stuff in the way uh, to simulate an actual situation. You know, once once that bull actually comes out, you know, in bow range and is in broadside or you know, slightly quartering to slightly quartering away, you know that you've been able to make those shots time and time again, you know? Yeah, a high degree of difficulty. I like that. Like you're always right. trying to make a tough shot for yourself. Yeah, because just the, the amount of difficulty in that shot puts enough pressure, I think, on a person. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're practicing real life scenarios. You're almost making it tougher than real life. So when you do get a real life scenario, you're ready for it. Yeah. I mean, you really want to make your practices. I, I mean, I don't like to make it hard all the time. You know, you want to have fun with it. Obviously, it's fun all the time. But the thing is, if you can really push yourself and, in, in, you know, when you're on the range or at home, whatever, once you are in an actual hunting situation and you have a bull that's, you know, slightly quartering away to you or broadside, you, you'll automatically um, kind of relax because it's almost like a chip shot. Yeah, you've been there before. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, and those those quartering angles are so good for, for lethal bow kills, too. I mean, broadside gives you the, the best, biggest target, and you know right where to aim. But, right. boy, those angles with an arrow really seem to, to do damage to animals and recover them quicker. And whether that's a little quartering towards or quartering away. But if you can angle that arrow in there and then and then always aiming for that offside shoulder. And, and then, too, like mule deer, you're always getting these steep shots and and you were talking about the steep angles and practicing those, you probably get a ton of those out of a tree stand. But I try to like center my arrow through the center of the body. And so sometimes if you're shooting down, it's aiming, you know, a little high to come down through that animal and then enter out down through. But I'm always trying to, to center that arrow in the body. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And you know, there's a, you know, there's an app. I don't know what it's called, but there's an app. Uh, for at least for iPhone, where um, you it's, it gives you like an elk or a, or a whitetail or something like that, and you can um, you can adjust it for whatever the angle is, you know, up or down, left or right, and it'll show you where your arrow hits and the, what your uh, what vitals your arrow will hit. You know what I mean? So you could think like, oh, he's quartering to. Um, and you, you hit him, and you you think you're you, you think you got definitely got heart in a lung. Well, when you when you look at this uh, simulator, you might not even hit the heart. You know what I mean? Oh. So it's 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 a good it's a good that's a pretty awesome tool to actually you know study angles and your shot placement. Yeah, and study the anatomy of the animal. That's, well, that's really it. cool. I've yeah. never I've never heard of that. So yeah, um, man, I'm gonna have to search that app. And so. Like you say, when you hit an animal, then you can kind of see what vitals you were hitting on the angle of that arrow or how that arrow yeah, was exactly. going through. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, it's called Shot Simulator. We're going to give it a plug here. It's called Shot Simulator. That's an app. But, I mean, the thing is, like, once you know where the vitals are and, uh, I mean, really know where the vitals are, and when, you know, when you're out practicing with your 3D target server, it gives you, a, I mean, more confidence in knowing uh, – where your shot placement is, you know, because you could you could take a shot on a mule deer buck and be like, oh man, that thing should be right over the hill, you know what I mean? And you and and you might have might have not made a great shot, and you could have bumped it, and the thing could have you know went how how far, or and could have led to not recovering the animal, you know? Man, absolutely. Well, and and bow hunting's tough too. Like, um, yeah. Well, and I. Like I think of these recoveries and and definitely def different recovery times to where you hit that animal and I know you know and it is it's science and so if you have you know a, a good knowledge of what you hit when that arrow went in and that's why I also like to use like bright fletchings so I can see mm -hmm. where my arrow hit and a lot of guys use those lighted knocks um, which they just right. made legal in Montana this year but just so you can see your arrow hit but. I've had some weird things happen in archery, but usually it's science. You get the lungs, heart, and liver. That thing can't live. It dies. And so I'm all about accuracy, pinpoint accuracy of putting that arrow in the right spot. But I've had like this – there's this weird shot where you actually hit right behind the shoulder, but it kind of – it's like a quartering two angle, and it comes yeah. out low and on the liver. I've had mm -hmm. funny things happen with that shot, and I hit a bull – with a really good broadhead that I trust, and I hit him mm -hmm. right behind the shoulder and came out low on the liver, and and went that night look for look for blood a little bit, and I thought I'm just gonna back out of here and come back in the morning. It was getting dark, and uh, gave him time, came back in the morning. I found that bull, and he was still alive in the morning. He was bedded and couldn't yeah, get up, crazy. but I had to give him a finish arrow, and I had sure. I had an antelope that I hit the same way that that took three four hours to die, and it it's science, and they're gonna die. But if you bump that animal. You know, then then you have a chance of losing him because he can go farther with with that adrenaline, you know, to where you right. can't track him. But yeah, it's it's um, you know, reading the hit and then giving it the correct amount of time to follow up. 
Yeah. I mean, if, they, if you don't see the animal fall over, I mean, it's best to give it plenty of time, in my opinion. Oh, you man. know, regard, regardless of where do you think where do you think you hit it, you know. I mean, a lot of guys are out filming their hunts, but they're you know, there's still guys that, you know, I don't film all, all my hunts. So, you know, in in the heat of the moment, I think I made a great shot, and you know, and I go look for an animal, look for the animal, and bump him, and he takes off, and you know, you don't recover him. Like if you just give him, if you just give him time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and we, we all learn that or hear that to give them time, but it's so tough and you're so excited really in the moment hard. and you, you think you hit that thing good. Like you, you want to go recover it, but you're right. Like you're just the, the smarter bow hunter and the smarter hunter. And you're just going to ensure that you're going to recover that animal to just give them, you know, more time rather than less. And usually if it's a really good hit, I like to give them like an hour, a solid hour, right. and then I'll go yes. recover. Um, but for some of these, like a, a gut or a liver shot or something like that, that that time should actually be, you know, four hours. And, it, and it's mm-hmm. about reading that hit and, and knowing that. And then it's also believing in that and actually taking that time. And I've had really good bow hunter buddies that, that have shot an animal and want to go recover it right away. I said, no, no, let's let's wait and give him some time. Let's just make sure make sure he's going to lay down and, and get stiff and die and we're going to recover. But I, I'm right. with you, man. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things to like giving not only giving the animal time, but taking time for yourself to just calm down and, you know, get your bearings. And because all that adrenaline is just like going nuts. Right. Like it's messing with your psyche and you're just like so fired up. And, and the, the the thing is, is just the, once a shot's made and you've lost sight of the animal, just, you know, sit, take, take some time, you know, get your get your thoughts back and uh, and then kind of reassess the situation and then go from there, you know. Well, and that's like my my favorite time to reflect to is after it, it's all been done. I mean, all the hard work throughout the season and finding that animal and then executing. Like, I really enjoy that hour uh, of mandatory wait time. Like, I think mm-hmm. it's good for me to just to reflect on the on the season and the situation and the stock and how it went down. Like, you, you're just um, I like to be in the moment right there, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it's way cool. And then I, I think what also helps too is we're talking about like experience on animals. Like I think guys need to, um, you know, pull a couple doe tags in the unit they're in and, and practice on, on does or on a cow tag or like I know, like just, um, high, high percentage hunts where you're going to get that opportunity to bend back your limbs and execute a good shot. But that just gives you confidence. I, I see some guys that start out trophy hunting too soon. Um, where I really think you got to get a couple harvests under your belt and really work up to that. Right, I'm with you. You know, it's the it's the whole it's the whole, the whole experience. It's not just, you know, uh, I think people get um, caught up on the trophy hunting like that's, you know, right out the gate. And the thing is, is like to to be, in my opinion, to be a, a good hunter is is the experiences, you know what I mean? You learn from the experiences. You can read all the articles and the magazines and watch the videos, all that stuff, but you need to get out there in the field and experience firsthand what these animals are doing and what it takes to, to harvest, you know, even a, even a doe, you know what I mean? Um, and then just kind of work your way up. I mean, there's nothing wrong with shooting a huge bull or a huge buck. <laughs> it's your first animal, right? Um but um, I think it's just the mindset, you know, Yep, is the, is the big thing. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, well, and we all want big bucks and big bulls, and those are fun, but you can't get too caught up in that either. And I think right. those those come with time as you gain that experience and you get better. And the reason you become a trophy hunter is you want a bigger challenge in front of you. You want more days of field and to put more into it and set this higher goal for yourself to, to hold yourself to. But just like you're saying, man, I think you got to work up to it, and you gotta you gotta embrace the entire experience from start to finish. Like whether you know, I still get excited to if I'm bow hunting does, I, you know, I'm excited, and it's good experience for me, and it it just gives me that confidence to know I can execute. And I 
I like like um like antelope hunting out west here. We get a, mm-hmm. a ton of opportunities. We can get like five stocks a day. Where on mule deer, we may only get five stocks right. an entire season. And so when right. you can get five stocks a day, that experience, you just learn so much from from those encounters and trying to close the deal and and getting shots. And then they're super jumpy. They're you know just the minute you think you have them, they'll jump your string and you'll miss it. <laughs> right. I'm sure it's the same thing right. with the whitetail too. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. And you know, for me. Uh, uh, yeah, it's all about it's all about learning for me. I'm I'm always I'm I'm always looking for an experience to to learn to gain some more knowledge. Uh, you know, to try to get the upper hand on on an animal uh, because every animal I've uh, you know I've been fortunate enough to um, harvest or kill. Um, it's not always it's not the shot that I think of first. It's always those mo- those moments leading up to it like how did i call it in how did i rattle it um you know its approach co- coming in like was it a- alert was it did it come running running full tilt in or you know it- it's those moments leading up to actually drawing my bow and taking the shot that i think about more more so than just the shot itself Oh man, for sure. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it does. It takes so much work and effort to be able to get an opportunity that that is what you spend most of your season trying to accomplish just to get that opportunity. You know, there's so few times you actually get to bend the limbs back and and let one go and execute, but I'm with you there. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and I, I think that's so intelligent, your approach to it, that you're always learning. And I, that's like me too, you know, I, I'm always learning and always gaining, you know, the most recent information in an area. And I'm always like it, hunts are always tougher than you think they're going to be when you get out there, you plan for this elk hunt and you're going to go in there and you're going to call one in and you'll have them by day three or whatever the case, but you get out there and the hunt just seems like tougher and more grueling. And, and all of a sudden it seems like this mission impossible almost that you've got to over overcome and and keep going towards your goal you know to be able to harvest one um but but always learning hunting is such a cool sport where you're never going to max out as long as you keep paying attention to the woods you're always going to be learning and you're always going to be getting better and i think that's why i love it as well yeah well that's it and it's i mean it's the perseverance of everything because you know you know i both know that you know you can be you know, out in the stand or up in the mountain feeling like this is never going to happen. And 15 seconds later, there, you know, a bull or a buck's coming in, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it turns, it, you know, that fast. So. Oh, it uh, does. Yeah. yeah. You, you got to just believe it, believe in it and believe that you just need this sliver of opportunity and you keep trying for it and trying for it. And it may mess up and it may seem like it's never going to happen, but I can't tell you how many hunts – that, that I've closed out on, on on the last day or the second to last day, and it comes together for me on day nine, day 10 uh, of going hard. It's just amazing how if you keep putting forth the effort, keep, keep being uh, persistent, like like opportunities will come your way. It will happen. That's right, man. Like uh, if, if you always go with the intention of learning and, and putting your the skills that you learned um, from other experiences – you know, it's one of those things where you're like, I know I'm doing everything right. You know what I mean? So the, your confidence level should be, you know, still lifted, <laughs> you know, even 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 on your last day of your hunt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you draw from the other experiences you've had in the hunting world and and, right. and and being successful before you draw on that, you know that it can just happen. Mm-hmm. And, and so right. so that's why you're willing to work so hard. Like I, I think about that when I take kids hunting a lot, like they don't know the payoff yet where we're us guys. We've been enough where we know the payoff where we'll do do anything. We keep hunting hard on that day eight, day nine, day 10, just chasing that encounter, knowing that it can happen. But the those kids that are experiencing everything for the first time, you know, they they don't quite know the whole process yet. And so you've got to be a little bit easier with them. And I'm always trying to do that with my kids is not push them too hard. We're out there mm-hmm. for the experience. We're out there to learn. We're, we're out there to enjoy nature. And it, if something comes together, great. But I, I, I got to be careful of that, that I don't push my daughters too hard when we're in the field and my wife for that matter too. Oh yeah, I know. I'm the, I'm the same way. Like I just want to get them out. Uh, my wife and kids, I want to get them out, uh, you know, put on, you know, putting on the miles and, and just digging in and that, you know, they're, they're not, uh, they might not be as into it as I am, you know what I mean? So you need to be cognizant of, of, uh, you know, what their outlook on, 
what they're looking to take away from the experience too, you know? Oh man, for sure. Yeah. That's so like me. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta really think about it and try to make it the best experience for them. And even though I'm so driven and want to go so hard and get them into so many animals, like pushing them that hard may not be fun for them. And I may ruin the experience for them because I'm pushing too hard. So yeah, I've got to kind of pull back on the reins and go, okay, this hunts for them. You know, I need to make the best experience for them I can. And yeah, we're going to try to get into yeah, right. but I can't walk them into the dirt trying to do it right exactly yeah it's a fine line right <laughs> it sure is um well yeah you've probably been shooting your bow a bunch lately uh any big changes you've made this year i saw you were shooting like um that the stabilizer quiver um i think it's made by trophy taker is that right uh yeah so um uh, option archery is making that it's called a quiverizer and i just got it from them and i so i've been trying it out uh and I like it so far. It's a pretty cool concept, you know. Um, it's you know it's a stabilizer and quiver all in one, and uh, um, I can definitely see some benefits, you know, using it. Uh, yeah. You know, it's probably not for everyone, but um, I mean, it you know it looks different because it's pretty much the first of its kind. But uh, yeah, it's it's cool for sure. Well, it is um, cool. We always wondered what to do with that weight of our stabilizer, and we're always trying to offset that weight. And it, it makes the bow kind of sit funny in our hands or it wants to lean towards that quiver side because of that weight. So that's a really cool concept to use that weight as your quiver. Now, can you slide that kind of back and forth to put your broadheads closer to your bow or farther away to kind of adjust the way that that bow sits? Uh, no, I think the bar – I believe the bar is just one set length. Okay. You know, you can adjust where the – uh, I guess the, I'm trying to think what it's called, like the arrow clip where you clip them in. Yep. Uh, you can adjust that up and down on the on the the bar, but the bar is a set length. Um, you know, because uh, on, on my bows in the past, I like running a, a rear bar opposite of the uh, quiver. You know, to offset, and I like I like a heavy bow anyway, so I add I mean I add a lot of weight to it. Um, but this I mean this quiverizer really enables me to just take that back bar off. Because uh, all the weight's right there, you know, centered for the most part, you know. Um, some guys will run it with the arrows on the left side of their bow if they're right-hand shooters. Um, I personally like on the right, right-hand right side like a normal quiver would be. Yep. Uh, but, it's, you know, it's just personal preference with that. Oh, man, you're speaking my language. I can tell you're a shooter. Heavy bows always shoot better than lighter bows, and so mm. I'll buy these light bows, and I'm always adding weight to them because they just hold better, and then and then they also, you know, they seem like they're a more forgiving shot. And then I'm the, I'm the same way. I use a sidebar in half for Western-style hunting, which is, mm -hmm. um, w which is unique. Not a lot of guys do that, but I, I, it's just like it's our money maker. It's like the one thing that you're going to count on to make your shot. You want to make it the most forgiving, best holding setup you can for in the field. And you can't go crazy with a four foot stabilizer or anything. But I'm with you. I like a 12 inch front and then a 12 inch mm -hmm. back. And I like to play with that weight and play with the angle of that back stabilizer and get that thing to hold as good as I can. And then it's wild how you can move that back stabilizer or move that those weight around to actually make your bow react differently at the shot like uh I yeah, know right. if i'm getting a bunch of low hits like i can either pull a weight off my front stabilizer or add a weight to my back stabilizer you know and then i seem to i seem to weed out those low hits and same thing with high i do the opposite where i add more to my front take some away from my back but man that's really cool yeah man you can you can tweak you know you can it's a constant thing if you if you really want to dive into it you can you can tweak on on your setup um, every day, <laughs> change something every day if you want. Um, yeah, but the thing is, is, um, I mean, for me, for me, it's, it's one of those things, uh, every, everyone, it's a personal preference, you know what I mean? Whether it's like, you know, heavy stabilizer, or you like the equivalizer, do you like a back bar, do you, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's all personal preference. It's almost like, uh, you know, how an instrument, like a neck of a guitar feels to one person to the next, you know, well, somebody likes a big fat neck. Some people like skinny necks and, um, you know, like it's like a, like a baseball bat, you know, to one bat feels different to one guy and the same bat feels different to another, to the next guy. It's just per, whatever, whatever it gives you confidence and makes you consistent. You know, uh, I'm all about, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I won't, I won't tell you like, Hey, no, don't use the equivalizer because it's ridiculous. You know what? If, 
if somebody likes it and they feel confident with it and they shoot great with it, then use it, you know? That's what it's there for. Man, you're, there is no right and wrong. The, no, you know, no. there's, and it's all about consistency, doing the same thing over and over. And you can get used to any setup, or like you say, you just have different preferences. And we're all built different. You know, some are small and stocky, long and lengthy. Like it, every bow fits us different and shoots for us different. And that's why there's so many different brands and so many things to go with. So, so you're right. There is no wrong and right way to do it. You, you just gotta. Practice with your bow, get comfortable with it, build confidence in it, and, and then when you're walking around in the hills with it, you, you know you can make that shot you need to make. Right, and you know the other thing is like once you find something you like and you're confident, like just stick with it, just shoot, just pra- practice, keep practicing. Don't. Uh, I know we. I just said like you could tweak all, every day, all day. That that's true. But if you find something that you're shooting really great, just stick with it and shoot it. You know, shoot it for the year. Um, because the the other side of always tweaking is like you you're not you never really settle into anything you know what I mean so um, you may you may be t- diving in so far that you find a setup that worked great for you and then just out of like sheer obsession of like trying things something different you go and try other things which makes you shoot worse again you know what I mean so once you in my opinion like once you find something that works for you just shoot it <laughs> no um well and a lot of times i i see you know you, you have this tendency to blame the bow like if it's if you're not shooting well and, and you're right it's just you you gotta like i set up my bow and i set it up the way i like it and then and then i just start shooting it and i don't make many adjustments from there once i know it's in tune it's in time and i set it up for myself and my grip and i put my attachments on it. I mess with the weights just a little bit, and I really work on my group size. But after I get mm-hmm. that bow shooting the way I want, I shoot it that way for the entire summer, four or five months, without touching hardly anything on the bow. Now I want to get used to it and shoot those tough scenarios. I know the bow shoot, and I know it's shooting right for me, so so stick right. with it. And, and, yeah. and like you say, everybody's different. Like I, the old Hoyt pro staff uh manager uh, kevin wilkie who's this great tournament shooter you know i asked him one time about stabilizers and what he liked and what he shot and he, great tournament shooter he's just a killer in the woods kills all these giant critters and he mm-hmm. told me he doesn't shoot any stabilizer no front stabilizer yeah. no back stabilizer he shoots a bare bow he wants it light for the mountains and that guy shoots lights out and kills a bunch of critters so there there is no right and wrong way to do it it's getting comfortable with your own setup yeah, that's it. I mean, how many guys do you know that shoot traditional that kill these monster animals? And you're like, <laughs> it's so it's it's so simple. It's just a stick and a and a you know stick string and an arrow. <laughs> You know, man, I know it. They're, they're not worried about accessories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and uh, boy, those things, you know, they're just another higher degree of difficulty. But it's just spending time with them. And I'm, I'm trying to get into the, the traditional. I want to do a hunt and get my first harvest with a traditional. And so I've been playing with mine quite a bit. And it, you know, it. It, it lowers your effective range. Now you're only good, you know, for me, I'm 20, 25 yards max. I shoot 30 and 40 in practice trying to get better. But with, then when you go out and hunt critters, you have to be like like that much better on your stalking skills to get that much closer. And it's a pretty cool experience taking that on too. And I haven't gone, you know, head first into it. I do, I love my compound and I, I, I love having a little bit more range on some of these hunts to create some more opportunities for me. But that right. traditional game, that's really cool and really fun. And I really respect those guys that are good with those things. Yeah, it's really, it's really awesome. And honestly, I could see myself gravitating towards the traditional side of archery. Um, and I and I've I've shot recurs, but I've got a couple, and I've shot them, you know, before too, and it's and it's addicting, but it's a it's a whole different beast, you know what I mean? Uh, from going from uh, compound to traditional, it's like you know going from a you know like a Porsche to a um, whatever a '60s '70s Buick Riviera, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a quite a it's it's quite humbling. Oh, it is. Well, and I love the precision of compounds and I, you know, I love like that little bit more distance. It it creates that many more encounters for you and, you know, trying to, trying to harvest, you know, big critters across the West. Like I love that compound, but yeah, I'm the same way where I think, you know, I could see myself in the, in the future someday just saying, yeah, I, I think I want to take everything on with the traditional and start over and start over with smaller animals and does and small bucks and, and kind of work my way up. But, you know, and it's good to, 
it's good to take on new challenges and challenge yourself too. And I know with this recurve, I know a lot about archery and has spent, you know, gosh, the last 20 years learning everything I can about compounds. But then you pick up a traditional bow and it's kind of like I'm starting over on the learning curve and I have to learn everything about this bow and the arrow setups and and flight and, and uh, tiller yeah. tune and like all this different stuff that, that I hadn't learned about or even more in depth or just a different learning process. But I, I think it's good to take on new challenges like that and kind of challenge yourself well yeah it's one of those things of like whatever it takes to you know spark that that passion back up you know yeah for sure well i do want to get my first harvest with a traditional i'm thinking like i hunt um arizona every year for um for coos mainly but i always Mm -hmm. see javelina down there i'm thinking like maybe i'll get a javelina tag and take the recurve down there with me or you know maybe do a a white-tailed doe or maybe like a montana buck or something like that kind of work my way up but i've been working with it oh about a year now and and i'm starting to feel pretty confident at those closer yardages so i want to have it out this year and see if i can get a harvest with it yeah that'd be awesome man yeah, no, went it um just up close and that that flight of that arrow is pretty cool. Um just a new challenge, something else to take on. Right. It's one of those things like just going uh back to the basics, which is kind of cool, you know. Yeah, well, and you kind of lose some of the tech gear, which I I love being a uh, a tech freak and learning about everything I can and having yeah, me the, too. the best rangefinder. I I love diving into the best sight rangefinder setup for my bow. Like I really dig that. But there's something cool too about being so primitive. All of a sudden, you, you're not using your rangefinder anymore, and you just like you say, you got a stick and a string, and you're out there trying to trying to make a harvest. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, to me, it's like no different than, uh, you know, being being into music. Uh, it's one of those things like. Um, it's like, uh, no, if I only wanted to shoot compound, I would be like, I only like rock and roll. I don't like country. I don't like jazz, whatever. But uh, for someone that loves music and loves archery, it's like you like the traditional side of things. You like the compound side of things. You like country music. You like uh, you like rock and roll. You like pop music, whatever. You know what I mean? Like you like it all. Oh, that's a cool way to look at it. Yeah, and one yeah. and two rifle hunting and and muzzleloader fall in that. And I've you know I've been mm-hmm. bow only for the last ten years or so just because I really love bows. But I you know I go out with my kids rifle hunting my dad, and, and a lot of the experience I learned, um, you know, I cut my teeth hunting with, with with a rifle. You know, during elk season here, during our you know it's an over the counter tag here in Montana, uh, public land high pressure. But I I learned a lot of the skills and and the tenacity from from rifle hunting. A lot of the lessons I learned, but yeah, I think sure. all facets of it, but yeah, that's a really cool way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, you got to be pumped here. So you're working hard on your farm. Um, what have you been doing? Are you planting food plots in there or? Um, <laughs> yeah, what... yeah, yeah. I planted some food plots. Um, so this whole winter in Nashville has been pretty mild. <laughs> so I was able to plant some food plots, man. I, I want to say, it's probably been a month or so, probably over a month ago. Um, but I actually planted one yesterday um, uh, in, in another spot, and I, I put a stand up today. Um, earlier in the year, I was uh, clearing out um, stand areas, you know. So um, it's just uh, just a lot of that stuff. Man, how cool. Yeah, prepping for season and there's so much work that goes into western game, but there's so much work that goes into whitetails and I have so much respect for those big whitetails as like they live in such a small tract of land, you know, that and they get so smart in that tract of land. You know, whitetails are are one of the the toughest animals to harvest, I think, especially a mature one. I'm going to I'm going to go to Ohio this year and and hunt whitetails. Um, I'm super excited about that. It'll be the the tree stand like you guys do, and trying yeah. to outthink and outsmart a big whitetail, which is really cool. I'm really looking forward to the challenge. Yeah, and you know the thing about whitetails these days is the first thing you do is look up. <laughs> it seems like, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a stand, you know, I don't know how many umpteen times you have a buck come in, and and you're like, what, of all the things to do, he looks up. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> no like, like he's like, yeah, he looks at like, hey, I know you're there. I'll see you later, kind of thing. Oh, that's I think, wild. You know, I don't. I don't know if that's just how like deer hunt evolved because you know uh, so many hunters, you know, in the Midwest they hunt out of deer stands. But I mean, I have I have stands um, throughout the property, and I honestly like hunting on the ground more than I like hunting in a tree stand, just because I like being able to be mobile, um, and I, I I really like the challenge. 
of getting you know a deer at eye level, and that's that's how I killed my buck last year. I just, uh, you know, I was I was on the ground, um, had a had a few does come in, and I mean they were like you know five yards from me, and I I, I couldn't even look up. Like I just had my eyes on the leaves on the ground, um, and when those does um, walked off. I was like, man, I'm too, I'm, I'm too in it right now. I need, I need to get, you know, get, get my, take, get my distance. So, um, I found this pile of brush. I'm like, well, that looks like it's, you know, it's got enough cover for me. So it was a spot I didn't even, I'd never hunted before. So I went over in this uh, brush pile. Actually, it was rattling, um, rattling horns and cutting uh, a shooting lane at the same time and rustling leaves and all that stuff. Um, and I got back to this brush pile, and within, I don't know, five minutes, this buck came just, like, just running in full tilt. You know, it couldn't have been a more ideal situation, you know what I mean? But um, um, I've killed bucks out of tree stands, too. And I, obviously, I, I like tree stands. I, I put one, you know, I've been putting them up. So uh, I like options, and I have options here, which is awesome. So uh, I just try to take advantage of it. Man, that is so cool. Uh, on the ground whitetails. That's how we hunt them in Montana here. It's fairly open country, and mm-hmm. and you never know where they're gonna be. You know, you try to pattern them as best you can, but that's that's the only way I've ever hunted them. And they're dang tough on the ground. But that's a that's a really cool story of your buck last year that you rattled in. Boy, and that rattling gets really exciting too, right? They come in on the fight. Oh man, it's it's awesome. It's that it's it's my favorite thing. You know, uh, if. If I couldn't go out whitetail hunting till you know, like the end of October, first part of November, I, I'd be fine with it, you know, because I like calling them in. That's that's more that's it's it's more fun than you know just sitting in a, a tree waiting for something to come by, you know. Well, and um, that's what I'm going to struggle with is the patience. And the 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 buddy that I'm hunting with out there says, you know, during the rut when you come out in November, we sit in the stands all day long. Like, oh my gosh, trying to sit in a tree stand for me all day long, I might <laughs> right. lose my mind. But yeah, I, I hear that. I hear that from a lot of uh, Western hunters. You know, they're like, oh, you got to sit in a tree. It's so boring. And then I've heard uh, Western hunters are like that actually got to got to kill kill their whitetails and they were like that was a, one of the hardest things i've ever done i like had no idea how tough it was man that's what i'm looking forward to is the yeah, challenge it, and i i'm not worried about being bored i i'm just like uh I, I mean, I guess it, I guess it is boring. Boring doesn't seem like the right. Like I'm going to be engaged in the hunt. That's just a long time for me to be sitting still and engaged. Like I want to go walk around and try to find something. But I know that's not the right approach where I'm going. I know that you know there's big mature bucks and I have to play it tentatively and and we're going right. to try to set these stands or setups you know where they're coming through. And so you know I know I have to be smart about it. But yeah, that will be a challenge for me for sure. Yeah. And the thing is, is like hunting whitetails out in Montana or Idaho, um, it's different than hunting whitetails in the Midwest, you know? Um, so it's, you, you have to look at it that way. You know, you might be hunting the same species, but the the terrain, you know, their backyard is different from, you know, my, from Montana to Wisconsin or, or Ohio or wherever, Kansas. You know, hunting whitetails in Wisconsin and hunting whitetails in Kansas is a whole different beast. You know what I mean? Kansas is it's more, more wide open area. and There's fewer um, trees. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, it's, it's almost like what – I mean, to a point, it's almost kind of like Western hunting, you know? Um, it, yeah, it seems that way to me. And well, and you got to be careful too. Like you're on your 50 acres and you're working so hard right now with food plots, and you're trying to create the best property and the best habitat for these whitetails, so you can draw them from surrounding farms and surrounding places where they want to be on your place. Like the last thing you want to go do is go blow them all up and blow them all out of there, you know. And so you you kind of got to play it tentatively and play it smart and make a good game plan for them. It seems. Yeah, and the and the thing about you know hunting whitetails on on smaller properties is like you get just get excited. You want to be out in the woods all the time. Well, you're out in the woods, but you're also leaving your scent and you're educating the deer. You know that you're there and where you where you are. You know, um, a deer can pattern you in <laughs> like two days. You know what I mean? So, uh, and they'll have you pattern for the whole year. Um, so it it just takes <laughs> like like for me, I was out you know in January. Um, setting up uh stand areas for the fall because i was like i just want to get it over with and so i can i can stay out of those areas 
for the rest of the, I mean, if, if at all possible for the rest of the year until I need to go back in and actually set the stand up or actually start hunting, you know? Man, that's so cool. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm so looking forward to this. And around here in Montana, we've got some decent whitetail, but a lot of the river bottom is it, private, and so you got to get permission. And every once in a while, yeah. I get permission on a place. Um, but, but it's really cool when you have a place to hunt whitetails where the whitetails are frequenting, you know, and coming through. And, and then just all the work you guys put in, thinking and theorizing. That's wild to be placing stands in January right after the season, but you're thinking about next hunting season and where you want that stand. And that way, you don't put any pressure on those deer throughout the rest of the year you just sneak in there on that one day the wind's right or those couple days the wind right wind's right get in there and then you're trying to harvest that buck yeah and you know um like i said we've only been on this 50 acres for the last year and um uh, i had a lot of I, I mean i i owe all my success to trail cameras you know so i had several trail cameras set up and i was uh, able to you know see what bucks were coming on the property where what times you know what days um and then i based uh where i put my stands for this january for this fall off of what i was getting on trail cameras last year you know so i mean some of these stands they might might not even produce anything but from this this last rut um it, it gave me enough info i think to actually go into this year um pretty confident you know Oh man, um, yeah, it's so cool. It's such a chess game. I just, uh, I just admire it as you talk about it and and talk about different facets of it. Like it is such a thinking chess game. But I'm sure those trail cameras have to be a huge part of it. And it's just got to be nice to know that those bucks exist. Like you may not see them that often throughout season, or you may only see them a time or two. But to know they exist and know that 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 chance is out there that they could come walking by. That's got to be a big part of the the motivation to keep after them all season. Well, that too. And it, it's, it's, you know, it kind of is a way to keep, well, it's a way to keep your sanity and a way to lose your sanity. Right. <laughs> um, but I mean, that, there's, there's some, there's some bucks that all they do is uh, during the rut, they, they, they'll, they're not totally nocturnal. You don't, you don't have any pictures of them during the day. You know, they're out there, but you don't have any pictures during the day. So instead of like losing sleep over like, why am I never seeing this buck during the day? And you have all these pictures of them at night while well, you're like, okay, well, you know, nothing else, I, you know, this buck's not huntable. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, yeah, they get uh, so smart um, running that nocturnal program that, yeah, you don't. Yeah, because it's, it's easy to get your, your, your mind or your heart set on one specific deer. But if that deer isn't moving in the hours you're, you need to hunt, um, you know, you need something, you know, you need to either look at option B or just kind of chalk it up to you know hopefully next season he'll you know mess up or whatever man that's got to be tough when uh you you don't you don't have much of a chance it's not like you can get out there at night when he's actually on his feet and so right like like getting pictures of him at night oh gosh that's got to be frustrating when they're running a nocturnal program like that but they they're just they're a smart animal aren't they well yeah you know um i mean they don't get bit no i mean no animal gets big by being dumb you know yeah well but living like five six years old on these small tracks and and like you say they know where predators and hunting them like your case in point is those deer looking up in the tree stand i think that's so wild that they know danger is above and humans are above And, and you also said that they pattern you like they're paying attention to the way hunters are coming in and out of the woods and the scent and they're trying to pattern you as much as you're trying to pattern them well, yeah, I mean, so you have, a, like, it's like, you'll have a buck on camera for, like, three days, right? And then you go in there, and all of a sudden that buck's not coming through. or And you catch him on some other trail camera, right, that's actually not too far from where you're hunting. And you're like, what in the world? Well, I mean, he's picked up on that you're in there, either through scent or, you know, you've made enough noise to where he's just going to avoid, you know what I mean? He's just going to avoid getting in any sort of compromising situation for him. Um you know, because I've I've known a couple bucks, really nice whitetails that actually lived like they bed, um, they were bedding next to it like a trailer house, like in a little patch of you know it's like swamp brush. That I mean, it wasn't even an acre, and that's where they were that's where they were bedding. And then at night they would come out to feed and go right back to that little plot of brush because they knew 
uh, they were safe from people getting in there um, and disturbing them, and they knew they could um, come out and eat at night. So um, that's kind of how they survived the, you know, the hunting seasons. Yeah, wild. Uh, survive it by being close to humans because they know nobody's hunting at or in that swamp ground close to that trailer. Yeah, that's yeah, that's weird. They but they they just learn. They learn the habits of people and hunters, and then they adapt to it. And um, yeah, so it, it doesn't surprise me at all. But yeah, that's wild. Living in the swamp right behind the trailer. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Huh. I mean, it, yeah, I mean the, the deer probably didn't move. I mean, he probably didn't even travel a mile. You know. Uh, throughout the whole season huh crazy yeah those those things are sure a challenge i'm really looking forward to to the midwest this year and like i'll i'll get my heart set in montana that i'm gonna hunt a whitetail buck and then we just have so much opportunity for mule deer and things and i love to mule deer hunt that that eventually i end up going muley hunting you know or oh, yeah. uh, end up harvesting a muley or whatever but i I, I'm gonna stick to it this year. I really want to get a nice white tail with my bow, and I don't, I don't need a giant one. Just like a, just a good decent buck, you know, a good decent three on top, decent mass, you know, just something that I'm happy with and and proud of, and and go from there. But yeah, I'm super excited about it. Yeah, and you're going to an area, you know, where uh, there's some pretty big bucks, so it should be, it'll be interesting. I'm excited to see what you, what uh, what happens this fall for you. Yeah, for sure. Well. Um, I love following you on social media, and you've just done a, a great awesome. job at sharing hunting you know, with some of the world that doesn't always see it. And you always reflect it in a positive light, and I love like how hard you're working at it and, and how much you promote um, fitness as being part of hunting. Um, you're just doing a great job, man. I really respect well, what I you're doing. I appreciate that. Yep, and Thank I, you so much. Yep, and I wish you all the luck this year. I'm going to be following along on your hunts as well to, to see how you do on your muley hunt and your elk hunt. And, and uh, I hope you kill a nice whitetail on your place this year. Oh, man, I, I hope so, too. I will definitely be sharing some pictures <laughs> and right some on, stories. Man. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I can't wait. Um, well, people can follow you on Instagram, right? Search. Uh, That's right. What's your Instagram ha handle, Jimmy? Uh, my Instagram is the Jimmy Herman. The Jimmy Herman. Okay. You're a great follow on Instagram, and, and like I say, uh, you just uh, uh, promote hunting in such a positive light. So thanks for doing that, man, and I, I hope to run into you at one of these shows or someplace, and, and uh, I'll be following along to see how you do on your season. Man, I appreciate that, Brian. Yep, right on. Well, thanks, Jimmy. You bet. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, that's an episode. Um, really fun conversation with Jimmy. Uh, you can tell, you can hear the passion in his voice when he starts talking bow hunting. He just absolutely loves it, and and I was so impressed that he that he works on all his own bows, and and uh, he's really trying to learn everything he can about bow hunting to to get better and and achieve his goals. So I just think that's really cool. I know he spends a ton of time on his fitness, so he's really good for the sport of bow hunting, and I I really enjoyed getting to know him and talking to him. Um, make sure that you, you go check out, uh, Eastman's hunting journal, the father's day special, get a call, both subscriptions to the magazine. Um, believe it's twenty nine ninety nine. um, really good content in there. We're really proud of what we're putting out. Uh, and then make sure to check out swagger bipods. Um, man, those guys are building good bipods. I, I just can't say enough good things. It mounts so easy to your rifle just through, Oh, through that, that, that screw on the front right there, you pull that out and it mounts all in. You don't need to drill any holes. Um, the thing just swivels so good on that bipod that you can, you can acquire a new target or acquire your target so quickly. Keep on your target. If he moves left to right, you don't lose them. You know, spread your legs wider to, to be a lower point of aim. Just, just tons of good features with those bipods. I'm super impressed with them. Um, and with that... Um, boy, just barely got this episode out this week. It's uh, Friday at, at 3.30 here, and I'm just finishing this up. But uh, I'm just getting back from this Hawaii trip. What an epic trip with those guys. And and uh, I talked them into recording a podcast the last night. It got late, and we recorded a podcast all about the hunt. But able to harvest some critters over there, including a good axis buck. And, and uh, the family had fun and, and just really good guests over there, really good group of guys, uh, three different guys and, and a couple other guys I met over there as well but uh, man they just take me it took me and the family to do so many fun things and and uh, what a great vacation so now just kind of back to the grind and um, it's not really a grind I live a pretty good life I can't really complain but uh, bear season's over now we're not in any hunting season just getting ready for these early season hunts 
Um, got that one coming up to Idaho and just crossing my fingers that I, I draw a Wyoming or um, might look and, and see if I can pick up a leftover in Colorado. Uh, got an early season Alaska trip planned, so just tons in the works. But um, I haven't been running during, the only time I don't run is during hunting season. And so I've taken a little break here and I'm just so ready to get back to it. So I'm going to finish this up, get it loose to you guys, and then I'll be out on the trails, hitting the trails and really putting in some good miles day in, day out. Um, I can't wait to start putting in the work to get ready for these backcountry hunts. I mean, it's uh, it's funny to think that, that it's just, you know, a, a couple weeks away and we're going to be, we're going to be hunting in the hills and then, you know, go from, from antelope and mule deer into elk and, um, man, I'm just really looking forward to it as I know you guys are too. So, uh, keep working hard towards your goals. Uh, hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Um, and we'll check in on you guys next week.